Welcome to the new version of Zen. Um, uh, one quick comment, you are probably viewing this video on YouTube. I strongly suggest that you increase the resolution of the video as much as possible. YouTube has an option for that. Typically it's in the bottom right uh, hand corner of the video. If not, you will have difficulty seeing the names of the things that I will click throughout the video. So as you can see, the uh, locate mode is slightly different, uh, but the basic idea is the same. We have these quick access buttons uh, for different uh, fluorescence configurations, as well as three buttons for different um, bright field configurations. We have one for just straight bright field, one for DIC for the objectives uh, lower to or equal than a magnification of 25x, and one for DIC for objectives with a, a magnification equal to or higher than 40x. Um, so part of the reason this is different is the the condenser, so the thing that switches between um, uh, conditions for, for bright field or DAC illumination is now automated, so you won't have to really go mess around uh, in there to do anything like you used to for the 700, for the small amount of people um, who were doing that. So, you know, in this, in this circumstance, as far as workflow goes, most of you are doing fluorescence imaging. Um, uh, some of you might be doing using the bright field to find things. You just click on whichever thing you want to use to find your cells. So for example, a typical example is DAPI. So if I click here, I can look at my sample in DAPI. And once I have something in focus, uh, we can move to the acquisition tab to do confocal imaging. Uh, so I'm going to pause the video, get, a, get my sample in focus, and then uh, return uh, in a moment. So I have something in focus. I'm going to turn the light off by clicking off here. Uh, you can also click on reflected light off. The advantage of this off button is it'll turn off the transmitted or the reflected light. And now we'll be ready to go to acquisition. So my cells are in focus. Uh, let's go to acquisition. If we click there, the microscope is going to switch to confocal mode. Um, the acquisition tab looks a little bit different than before. So we're going to go over the many changes. Um, in terms of settings, you select the setting for the combination of fluorophores that you want here. Um, so this is the same as it was before, except that now there are no multi settings. Uh, so there's just one setting option uh, for all the typical combinations of fluorophores. If there is um, a combination of fluorophores that's not similar to the ones here that you want, let me know and I will add it. Um, and if you have four fluorophores, uh, and want to go a little bit faster, or you have more than four fluorophores, uh, there are ways of doing that, but they're a little bit complicated. So uh, please reach out to me and we'll get that set up for you. Um, so the particular slide I have has uh, DAPI, Alexa Fluor 488, and a dye that's very similar to Alexa Fluor 594. So that is what I'm going to select here. So I'm going to click on this, and that is going to load um, that setting. Um, so you can see that um, many of these things uh, look very similar to before. As I said, I'll, I'll point out the differences as we go. Uh, one important difference is that if you load an image and want to reuse settings from that image, the reuse button is no longer down here. Uh, once you open an image, it's just up here. So let me actually open an image so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, So if I wanted to reuse the settings from this image, that button no longer lives down here. It is up here near uh, the settings. Um, so I think that makes sense. Uh, in any case, that's where it is. So you should be aware of it. Um, OK, so a few other important differences um, in this system. So uh, the laser wavelengths on this system are slightly different than before. So the LSM700 had a 555 nanometer laser and a 639. So this one has a 561 and a 640. That's a subtle difference, but it can make a, it, it can cause uh, some differences in the excitation intensity for certain fluorophores. Uh, the more important difference is that uh, these new lasers are um, overall more powerful than the ones we had before. And they're calibrated so that they're very linear, which was not the case before. So before, if you went below 2 or 3% and you halved the, the, the percentage, the laser power wasn't necessarily half. It might drop by more. Now they are very linear. 
Um, so they're very well calibrated from you know about 0 0.05 all the way to 100%. Um, so that's the range over which I've checked it, which is the range that you'll likely use. So they're very well calibrated. And what that means is uh, actually at the low intensity values of low percentage values of the laser, you're going to get way more power than you did before. Uh, so the equivalencies are, and, and these are going to be in all the, our default settings, to get the equivalent of 2% power that you had before, you're going to use 1.2% of the 561 and the 640 lasers and 0.7% of the others. And overall, usually even at higher powers, the lasers in this system will be uh, more powerful than the lasers in the 700. Uh, so you will typically use lower laser powers. Um, a related point to this is that there is now a high intensity laser range mode. Uh, so the lasers, if you don't have this clicked on, they max out at 3.5 for the 405, 4.5% for the 488, and 5% for these. So if you need more laser power, you'll need to click on this, and that's going to adjust the laser, uh, the range which you have available uh, for all of them. Now, you typically will not need to do that, and the reason is because the lasers are more powerful and the detectors are more sensitive. Um, you can stay away from the high intensity laser range and usually get um, quite nice images. Um, so that brings me to my, my, my next point, which is that the detectors on this system are significantly more sensitive than the detectors before. Uh, they are what, call, what are called GASP detectors. Um, as a result, you will typically need lower master gains than you did before. Um, the detectors are also damageable, so if if you saturate the detector, you can damage it. So please be very cautious. Uh, and there are two more things relevant to the detectors, which is they start at 500. So below 500, they just go to zero. There's no option to do less than 500 volts. And the second is that they have a safety mechanism where um, if you accidentally saturate a lot of pixels on the image, the detector will shut off. So I'm not going to demonstrate that because I don't want to damage our fancy and expensive new detectors, but just be aware that that safety feature is there. That said, uh, please proceed with caution so you don't activate that feature because that'll lower the lifetime, uh, reduce the lifetime of the detectors. Um, so another another point here, you'll see that the bits per pixel, this is something that we I, I really didn't emphasize during training before, but this is something you'll have to know uh, with the transition from the 700 to the 900 is that now our images will be 16-bit images, not 12-bit images. So what that means, there's sort of two implications of that. The first is that uh, when you're setting up, up an image, you're no longer shooting for uh, intensities of between 2,000 and 2,500. Rather, you're going to shoot for intensities between 30,000 and 35,000 uh, because the maximum is now 65,000 and change. So that's one thing. So you have sort of a different intensity target. Uh, and, and the second is if you're doing Z stacks and subsequent deconvolution, and this is very important, when you go to AutoQuant, you will have to create deconvolve files that are 32-bit floating point. If you use 16-bit unsigned integer, you will get incorrect results now that we have 16-bit images here. So again, if you're doing deconvolution, you have to change how you save your images from the LSM 900. If not, there will be mistakes that will preclude you from comparing uh, images uh, from from diff uh, comparing intensities across different images. Uh, if you have any questions about that, of course, let me know. So um, with that, let's let's get started. Uh, I'm going to look uh, at what I have in focus here and and um, make sure that it's in, in focus in the confocal and and let's adjust the setting. So I'm going to click on the DAPI and go to live. And already you see a difference, which is it used to be that before, when you clicked it live, whatever was checked here would be scanned. But right now, in the new version of live, only what is highlighted is scanned. And if we change what is highlighted, what's being scanned here will also change. Now, I don't have the settings such that we can see anything yet, but you'll see that in a second. So that's a difference uh, in how live behaves. Uh, so let's let's take a look at this. Let me switch to range indicator. Another difference you'll see is that it used to be that with when we had the digital offset at zero, uh, we would have a lot of blue pixels. That's no longer the case, meaning you, you typically don't have to adjust the digital offset. You can leave it at zero, and that's fine. Um, if you look at this image, we really can't see much. If I do um, here are the display settings, if I just hit min-max to kind of 
get close and see things. We can see some nuclei. I'm on the 10x objective. They're not particularly bright. Let me get things in focus. I'm going to move in one direction, then in the other. So now things are brighter. Notice that um, it's no longer the case that the display saturates. So with range indicator, now red pixels will only appear when they are true, truly saturated. Even though I've saturated the display here, the red will only indicate true pixel saturation. Um, so this seems to be, uh, you know, it seems to be kind of in focus. Um, let me, uh, as you can see, it's, it's very dim. Let me switch uh, to the 20x objective to first show you how to do that in the software and then uh, to just get a nicer image uh, for the purposes of this training video. So let me go to 20x. So one important point to note is that um, in this system, the uh, parfocality uh, will be much better than in the previous system. Meaning uh, if you're on the 10x and you're in focus and you switch to 20x, you should roughly be in focus. So let's, say if what I, let's see if what I said was true. If I go to live, do min max, you can see it's pretty much in focus. So the parfocality is much closer than it was before. Um, so if I go to range indicator and then just say reset, you can see that you know I can't really see anything. And uh, another uh, important difference in live from how it operated before is I no longer have the controls here to do the histogram. So the way we have to adjust the intensities to get to the middle of the dynamic range is slightly different now. So we're going to use this display, which is a logarithmic display. Uh, and we're going to you know, increase the gain or the laser power as needed to get us to this sort of middle. Uh, so we want the right edge of this histogram, which is now for the entire image. Uh, we want those pixels, so the right side of the system, to get to roughly the middle of the dynamic range, which is about 30,000 or 35,000. So I'm just going to increase the master gain. As I do that, you'll see that the right side of the histogram is getting to the middle. And so this is a reasonable intensity uh, for us to use here. Uh, and we want to make sure interpolation is off so we can see the, the actual pixels in the image. Uh, and so this is a, a, a reasonable um, uh, you know, a, a reasonable intensity to shoot for. And just like before, you can balance laser power and gain to get images of higher or lower quality. So for example, if I lower the um, the laser to, I don't know, 0 0.05, which would have been vanishingly low before, and I increase the master gain, you can see that, um, you know, it, it's very noisy. Even though if I get to the same intensity, it's, you know, I've had to max out the detector, it's very, very noisy. If I now lower the detector gain and increase the laser power, and I think we started at 0.7, uh, and then if I go maybe to twice that, you can see I'm, I'm around 15,000. So if I go to twice that, I'll be um, roughly at twice. And so you can see the quality is better. So this all behaves the same as before. It's just that you will typically be operating with lower uh, laser intensities and master gains than you're used to. And the reason is the same percent here is now a higher absolute laser power. And the same gain here corresponds uh, to a more sensitive detector. Um, so let me uh, switch to another channel, the 488. Uh, you can see we, we, we can't see anything here. If I click on min max, there is actually something there. Uh, so if I reset this and increase the master gain, That's about the intensity we want. The quality is not great. Um, that's because we were out of focus. You can see I'm saturating, but not enough to trigger the um, the overload detection on the circuit on the uh, special PMTs. So I'm going to lower this, and you can see that you know with a really low laser power compared to what we had before in terms of percent of this number and a relatively low master gain, we're getting a pretty nice image, okay? Um, finally, let me adjust the 594. Um, I'm just gonna increase the gain, and you can see here there's some saturated pixels in this object, which I'm just gonna get out of the field of view. And again, the, the, you'll notice immediately that the joystick is flipped from what you're used to. Uh, again, I apologize for that, but there's no way of, of changing that without breaking other things, unfortunately. Um, so you'll just have to adjust. Um, 
Okay, so we have this, and you can see that only one is being scanned at a time in the live mode. And if you switch, you switch, even though all three are checked, you switch what you see. Okay, so um, a few um, a few comments about um, some options for navigation in the software, which are really nice. So when you're in live or continuous mode, this version uh, of Zen has an option where if you just double click on something, that something will become centered in the field of view. So let's say we were interested in this cell. If I double click there, that cell is now in the center. If I want to see this cell, if I double click there, that cell is now in the center. So that's a very useful thing for navigating, I think. The other useful thing is if you hover near the edge, you'll see that this blue thing appears. If you click on that wide blue thing, it moves over, I think, by about half the field of view. So let's try that again, but moving in the other direction. So what I expect is this will go there. Let's see if that's true. You can see it is. It moved by about half the field of view. And if you go to the very edge, you can see that, it's, that this is the edge and this is the very edge. It'll just move over by one entire field. Okay, so you can see that is actually the bottom of a cell that we had before. So if we go back up, we're back where we started. Okay, so those are some navigation options that are very nice. Uh, snap works the same as it used to. So if we snap an image, uh, it will do you know, all the channels with all of these settings. Uh, the difference is, if I snap another image, it won't overwrite it. So these images are all uh, kind of saved in a temporary folder. Uh, so this, this has a, a good part and a bad part. So the, the good part is uh, you won't have this phenomenon that we used to have in the previous um, Zen software where you would accidentally click snap and lose what you had before. That's a good thing. The bad thing is now every time you hit snap, uh, you'll have a new image uh, cluttering your workspace. So you'll have to be a little bit more diligent about kind of sorting through and making sure you save things as needed. To save images, it's the same uh, as before. You're going to click here to save or do control S and then you can sort of save it wherever you want. And just like in the other uh, microscope, there's a data drive and I've created a user data folder just like before. And uh, you know the users are there. Now, I have not put your LSM 700 data here uh, because mainly I, I, I don't want anybody confused. You can't open an LSM 700 image and reuse the settings. It's a different microscope that is not gonna work. But I do have that data if you want it. It's on the D drive as well. It says LSM 700 D drive backup and there's the date. If you go in there, you'll be able to find your user images previously if you just wanna get a sense of what it is that you were doing, uh, even though you can't reload the settings. All right, so let me uh, close this. Um, so uh, as, you, as you adjust settings, uh, you may want, uh, like before, to, to check the bleaching and, and to see what, what the settings actually look like with all of this stuff engaged. So the live is not going to do exactly all these things, as you know, and it's not going to do the averaging. So let's say we want an image with 4x averaging, and we want it um, with you know a higher pixel count. Um, and we want to see whether this is going to bleach. Uh, so trying to do that here with live, we can kind of see if it's bleaching by looking at whether this is trending down, but it's not as easy as when we were able to like make a little box and um, uh, and 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 see what the numbers were. And the other issue is that live is not actually doing the averaging, uh, nor the 1024 by 24. Whereas if you hit continuous, it will do that. It will do. It will acquire the image exactly as it's going to be acquired if you hit snap or start experiment. And so that's a good thing if you if you wanted to like check bleaching or just check what the image is going to look like uh, with all the, the settings here. Uh, and you can see also that you have the histogram available. Now this looks a little bit different. It's a little more cluttered, but the same stuff is here. Um, before sh showing you how the histogram works, you'll notice that we're scanning all three channels at once. That's a, a little bit um, slow. So I'm going to turn off uh, the ones that aren't DAPI and I'm going to go to continuous. I'm just going to click on range indicator. So this is the same as it was before. And we can draw a little rectangle, for example, around that nucleus. We have the histogram for that one. You can see that this is uh, is too high. I should really um, lower the, the laser intensity or the master gain so it's not saturated. So I'm going to do that now. We want to be aiming more for around here. 
So let's see. So yeah, maybe that's overkill. So that's probably about where we want. And uh, and then you can see here that it says arithmetic mean intensity. So that's the mean intensity of the pixels in here. I can zoom in by using the scroll wheel, which is kind of a nice feature. And uh, we can see whether this number, as we scan over and over, is getting smaller. And if it's not, you're not bleaching. Um, so you know the essence of this is really very similar to the way it was before. I'm going to unclick that uh, so to fit to view. Um, so that's those are things that are different. Uh, for the uh, live mode and in the continuous mode for how the histogram works, which is something that uh, we did a lot of um, on the LSM 700 for setup. So let me uh, describe a few other uh, differences on the system. Um, let me get rid of that little box. So that's another difference. These little box persist. So that's a nice thing in some cases. In some cases, it's a little bit of, you know cluttering visually. Um, but that's you know the software. Those boxes now persist. They don't disappear um, like they, they did on the 700 in the latest version. Um, so one, one other thing that's that's notable here is that um, bi-directional scanning works much better. So on the 700, what happened is that um, if you engage bi-directional scanning, you typically saw artifacts. So you saw things that looked weird, uh, particularly at high speeds and on the edges. Uh, this is less of a problem for those of you who have been trained on the LSM 710. On this system, it's more like the 710 in that you can use bi-directional and mostly it's fine. So let me show you what that looks like. So if you go to continuous, for example, here. Uh, I'm going to turn off uh, the averaging. That's another thing that you might notice. You don't need as much averaging. Again, that's because the the um, uh, the photomultiplier tube is much more sensitive. Um, so you'll see that if I turn on bidirectional, you don't really see much of a difference. You might be able to see some subtle effect here, but I, I don't really see anything. Uh, so that's nice because bidirectional goes twice as fast. Uh, let me show you a, a circumstance where you might see some of a little bit of a difference. So I'm going to zoom in by a factor of three. Uh, this is probably overkill. Uh, let me go to my factor of two. So, okay. So if you now look at, so let me center it here to get that on the edge. Uh, so if you now switch to bidirectional, you'll see that there are these very subtle imperfections along the edges. It's very, very subtle. You, you probably, with the YouTube compression, can't even see it. Uh, but if you, you do it and you don't care, then that's fine. But if you do it and you, and you do see something, um, the workarounds are you either switch to unidirectional or sometimes it's actually worth your while to, if you go to bidirectional and then you lower the speed a little bit, this, tends to, this problem tends to go away. And if the total frame time is less than if you had the highest speed and the bidirectional, which is the case here, well, then it's worth your time to do that. Okay, so, so in this case, uh, it's, it's really, um, you, you really should try the bidirectional because it can save you a lot of time and it works way better than it did on the 700. Okay, so um, another thing that you may have noticed already is that we no longer have the zoom down here. It's changed locations. The zoom is up here. Um, so that's just simple. It's the same slider as it was before. It's just instead of at the bottom of this acquisition mode uh, window, it's at the top. Um, the other thing is if uh, for those of you that, um, and one, one other thing, you can zoom out just like you did before. This comes at the cost of quality around the edges, but I know for quick and dirty things, some of you uh, just like doing that. Um, the, the other thing is that there's, there's, a, there's a subset of users there aren't that many of you, but that, that like uh, rotating images, uh, especially in tissue, so that all the images have the same orientation. So if you want to do that, you have to click here to open the scan area. And here you have the ability to rotate by grabbing this, moving that. You also have the ability to move the scanning area. I strongly suggest you don't do that uh, because you'll have lower quality going through the edge of the objective. Uh, if you get lost, you can reset these things individually here or reset the entire scan area there. For most of you, just keep this closed. It's, it's a way of uh, avoiding problems. So let me stop here. So uh, another thing that many of you do is um, try to image at the highest possible resolution. So if you recall, um, the way we used to do this 
uh, is I would say, well, first you have to figure out what kind of image area you want. Um, to kind of fit everything you, you want. Then you, you need to figure out what pixel size you want. From those two things, you determine your zoom size so that you get the area you want. And then you have to figure out what frame size to get the proper pixel size. So there's a lot of sort of math and back and forth. So, so this software has the nice feature that um, there's this confocal button. And when you press this confocal button, it will adjust the frame size so that the pixel size corresponds to what before we would call the highest resolution, not the high, but the highest resolution, and for the particular floor for that you have set up. So if you wanted uh, to do the highest possible resolution, for example, if you were on a 63x, you could click on DAPI, click on focal, and the pixel size will be about 0.07. Um, so that's just a nice feature. It'll, add, it'll Once you have your zoom set to whatever it is that you want, it will adjust the frame size to the proper value. It used There used to be an optimal button that allegedly did the same thing, but it didn't actually work that well. But now this one actually does work well. You still have the option of these sort of presets, but if you're trying uh, to get subcellular details and really want to maximize the resolution available to you in, on the system, uh, pressing the confocal button uh, will work uh, quite well. So um, Z stacks are the same as before. Uh, the only difference is instead of showing up here, they'll show up here. Uh, it's the same old, same old. Uh, use optimal if you're doing high resolution. Use an interval of 0 0.2 if you're on the uh, one of the 40x or 63x objective and want the highest possible resolution. Um, so that's that's really the same. Um, so that covers uh, most of the basic functions. Uh, I, what I'm going to discuss next is the um, one of the things that has changed the most, which is how to do tiling on this system. So um, let's get into that. Tiling on the system is very different. You'll notice that uh, there used to be a tiles and a position uh, checkmark. Now there's just tiles and it's actually both. So you click there, you will see this shows up. And this looks very different to the way it looked before. Okay, you can ignore that stage calibration uh, error message, it's, it's fine. You don't, you don't need to calibrate the stage, so don't worry about that. Um, so let's go through uh, a few very basic uh, tiling and kind of map and find workflows. Um, so you get, you get a feel for how to do this. So uh, when, you, when you click on tiles, first make sure that there are no uh, tile regions or positions already engaged. If there are, just delete them. There shouldn't, but just in case. To start the tiling, you will need to click here where it says Show Viewer. This will open uh, this, which looks complicated, but it, it's actually easier than what it, what it looks like. For the very simplest kind of tiling, uh, which is you know, 3 by 3, 4 by 5, where you just say uh, you know, what the dimensions of the grid are, you click on this. You decide how many tiles you want in X and in Y. Um, by default, it assumes that the position you are in is the center of the tile, but you can change that if you want. And uh, once you're satisfied with this, you click on Add Tile Region, and it shows you uh, where it's going to take a tile. Uh, and so if you're happy with it, and you'll also see that it added a tile region object here. So if you're happy with this, if this is what you want to do, you can say Start Experiment. And it will take a three by three tile. Now, importantly, um, it will not automatically stitch them. So this is also another difference from the LSM 700, where we usually had it set up to automatically stitch. That is no longer the case. So you will have to stitch uh, these images um, later. So. Um, if you look carefully here, you might be able to see some slight imperfections along the edge. Though the system is so well aligned that they're actually hard to see. So you can see it here. You can see kind of that 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 imperfection there. Um, so clearly, this image has been just you know joined together, but it's not stitched. So I'm gonna I'm gonna save this. Uh, I'll call it. Um, uh, let me make a new folder here. Uh, I'll call it 3x3 three three tile. T 
to stitch this tile, you're going to go to Processing. And to bring up the stitching, you're going to either search for stitching here. Um, so you'll type stitching um, and just select that method. Or if it's recently used, you can double click there. That'll bring up this. And here you want to make sure that it says new output. That means it'll make a new file. If you do in place, it'll overwrite. Fuse tiles will blend the edges. Um, if you don't have that, it'll align them, but it, but it won't blend them. And um, then we make sure that this image is selected. So you can see it's there. It's setting the input automatically. And then if we hit apply, it will stitch. And it'll create a file with the same name, but uh, you'll see it says stitching. So if I go to tile three by three, you'll see that over here, there's that clear imperfection. If I go to the same spot in the stitched image, you can see it's perfect. And it's not because of the interpolation being on. You can see it, it did a good job with the stitching. So now if we wanted to, we could save this as the stitched version uh, of that image. So that's how you do a very simple uh, tiling and, um, and, uh, and stitching. But there are other sort of types of tiling and other types of workflow that we used um, we used to do, uh, namely map and find or um, uh, random sampling. And so, how how do you do some of those things? Um, so let me show you the the kind of map and find uh, thing. So let's say that you you want to do um, some sort of random. Uh, random um, random sampling over a large area. So how would you do that? So um, we're going to do tiling again. And we don't want this anymore. So we have to go here and delete this tiling region. Uh, and instead, we're just going to do the following. We're going to, we'll just do it in this channel. We're going to lower the zoom. So it's a big area. And we're going to do a 5 by 5. So this is very similar to if you recall the preview on the other system. Uh, we're going to add a tile region. And now uh, I'm just going to zoom out so we can see this. Um, we are going to click on this preview button because this is going to generate a preview that then we can then navigate on uh, and generate other uh, conditions on. So if we say start, You can see it's it's creating this preview. And we can zoom in as it's doing this. And we can adjust this if we want to see things. So you can see it's very slow. So I'm going to actually pause this and then stop it. The reason it's very slow is I didn't realize that the frame size was set very high. So I'm just going to reduce that to 512 by 512. And I'm going to say, all right, let's do another preview. And I'm going to set it to bidirectional as well. So a nice feature is that you can also, because the objectives are so well uh, parfocaled on the system, you could actually do the preview on one objective, for example, the 10x or even the 5x, if you push the, the intensities, and then use that as a map for the other ones. But let's just do it um, this way. Um, so I don't have to change objectives in, in the middle of this training video. So you can see there's been a lot of bleaching in this sample. So once we've concluded making the preview, uh, we can now use this preview image for both navigation and for random sampling. So the first thing I'm going to do, there's a lot of visual clutter because of, of this thing. So I'm just going to delete it. We don't need that anymore. And uh, I'm going to increase the zoom just to show how, well, maybe that's too much, just to show how we can kind of navigate in this area by clicking. So if I go to uh, Live, You'll see the way it's set up on the right. We see wherever we are here. And you can say, oh, that's an interesting cell. If you double click, you just go to that one. If you double click, you go to that one. If you double click, you go to that one. So this is the same as, as, as it was before, though the interface is a little bit nicer because you can easily zoom in by using the scroll wheel on each one. So, so that's, that's a very nice thing to just navigate around. Um, the other thing that uh, this can do, which is which is very uh, useful, is random sampling. So let's say this is this contains cells that you want to uh, take random samples from. How do you do that? So to do random sampling, we're going to exit preview. We're going to go to this um, to set up new positions. 
we're going to make sure that we have random turned on and no bias towards the center of the edge. And we're going to now draw a square where we want the random samples. And a reasonable thing to do is to draw it where we took the preview. And so now these positions, which show up in the tiles here in position arrays, these are all the different positions, um, represent random samples. So what we can do now is if we go to live and we double click on each one, it will show us random samples within that area that we decided uh, was going to be our search area. So this is an incredibly useful tool, as you can see, to truly take unbiased data. So I think it'll be very useful for a lot of you. So I want to switch to showing you uh, another workflow related to tiling that people use quite a bit, um, which is more typical in um, sa samples that have sections on them. So I've changed, I've changed the, uh, uh, the sample we have here, and I've switched to the 10x objective, and I've lowered the zoom so you can sort of see what the sample looks like. This is just uh, a section with this um, kind of you know imperfection here. But let's say that you wanted to uh, just tile this region at higher resolution. Uh, how would you do that? So uh, let me show you. As I said, we're, we're on the, the 10x objective. Um, let's say we'll start by taking just a, a quick uh, preview uh, of, of the section to get an idea of what we're dealing with. So first, we're going to go here. We're going to delete all the stuff. So we, we want to delete all these position arrays. Uh, these were some of the random samples. We don't have any single positions. We don't have any tile regions. I'm going to click on show viewer. So it brings up this. Um, it was actually already up. I'm going to go to tiles and I'm going to say, sure, I want to do um, a five by five uh, centered here. So I'm going to add this tile region um, and just go to preview. I'm going to ignore the fact that this is still here. Um, just say start. So as you can see, it's uh, creating this preview image. But let's say I, this is just for preview, but what I actually want is to get sort of higher resolution image information of this. So uh, how would I do that? So let's say we're actually wanting to image at 20x. And let's say we actually want to image with sort of fairly high resolution. You can see that it, it has adjusted this tile region, but we don't, we don't need to do that anymore. So I'm just going to delete it. Uh, we want to do something else, which I'll show you in a second. So if I go to 3x, so let's say we want to image with those conditions. So let me just briefly check that the conditions are reasonably OK. So this is way too bright. OK, so that's a little better. And you can see it's pretty par focal. I didn't really adjust the focus. So let's say that now we want to um, take a region. Um, it's kind of a, a square region here. We have multiple ways of defining it. One is we can just draw a contour, just draw a rectangle, and then we'll tile there. So that's one option. Another option, I'm just going to delete this, is we can mark positions that we want to include. So we can say, OK, I want this corner there, this corner there, excuse me, I have to click there to add the position, this corner there, and then this corner, and then that corner. So you can see that I, I've kind of said I want those three, and it creates a tile region for that. So that's another option. Uh, we can also, if I delete this, um, just draw a region that we want to tile by clicking here, clicking there, and then just draw, and it'll figure out what it needs to do. Or uh, for those of you who would use uh, the convex hull mode, you can draw something irregularly shaped. So you could do something like this. If you're only interested, for example, in the parts that are there, and if you close it by right-clicking, that's done. So you'll get 
sort of this kind of tiling, um, which may be more uh, what you're looking for. Um, so you can see that w with this sort of preview, you can do everything you can, bef you could before uh, in a more really, it's a little bit more complex, but uh, in the end, it ends up being much more user friendly to do complicated things like this. Um, this the, the new software has uh, many other features, which I, I will not get into right now, but I'll mention them in case you want me to go over with with uh, on them with you uh, when you have your individual training, and there will be other training videos that will that will cover them uh, briefly. Those other things are: this system is not only a confocal; it has a color camera, and the color camera can be used to create these maps, and it is much faster than the confocal. So you can actually very quickly create maps like these uh, with that camera, and then switch to confocal. So that that's a workflow that I haven't gone over, but it um, it's very useful if you have sort of sections that you need to explore. Um, you can also do uh, you can tile samples um, that are not evenly in focus. So if the sample uh, is tilted for some reason, or uh, because of the way the slide was prepared, or or if it's undulating and uneven. You can compensate for that in the tiling. That's a very nice feature. Um, you can also do multi-tiles. So if you want, you could do one, for example, one tile there, but you could also you know, do another tile here. And you can see these show up as different objects, and you can even add positions if you want as well. Um, so you could have those tiles and then you know, a few positions, um, and it will do all of those things. Um, and, and finally, um, this system will not, it will have the, the live incubator from the LSM um, 510. Um, and um, it, so if you're interested in doing uh, live cell imaging, let me know. Uh, this has more features than the LSM, uh, excuse me, I think I said 510, 710 has more features and, and you can do you know, bleaching and uh, complicated workflows where you, know, you do loops of loops of things. So, if you have weird ideas uh, for what you need to do based on this, your science, uh, let me know. I'm pretty sure we will be able to do it with the system. The software is incredibly powerful and flexible. So uh, with that, that concludes the, the basic things that I wanted to show you. Um, let's go over how to shut down the system.